John chapter 16, but the very last verse, just one verse before what we covered this morning about the real Lord's Prayer is John 16, 33. And you're going to read one word in the verse when we get to it, our key word, our title of our message tonight when you find it. Verse 33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's back up to get a little bit of context. Verse 29, his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Because you're about to be tested whether you believe. Behold, 32, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, they were persecuted, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Oh, he's talking about them being scattered, because they're going to come for him in the garden, and they're going to threaten to hunt them down, and they all forsook him, and fled. And then he uses the word overcome. I have overcome the world. Overcome. A word of victory. To overcome something. Now we all have trial and tribulation that God will help us to overcome. Every day of every week you probably have something in that day to overcome but sometimes you've got something bigger that's bigger than the day it's something you've been dealing with for days or weeks or months or years and you need to overcome and you need to continue continually overcome now the word overcome answer me who said it who said the word overcome Jesus said it who won the victory at Calvary? Jesus did. Who then possesses the victory? Jesus does. Is he willing to share? Yes, he is. Not the glory that he's about to reveal in the very next verse, but the victory. And he's willing to share the victory with you. He's willing to share the victory with me. And this is good because we need victory. This is good because we all have something very major to overcome. The world is tough. But in Jesus, we do not have to be victims. We can be victors. The world is tough. Trials can be overcome by triumph through Christ. Jesus overcame this world, and then he wants to help us become overcomers. So we don't have to always be, okay, under the circumstances. Not under. Overcome. Rise up on eagle's wings. That's what an eagle does when they sense the storm. They spread out their wings and they let the power of the storm lift them until they are above the storm. And... In Isaiah, it talks about soaring, rising up on eagle's wings, wings like an eagle. And it's a beautiful picture of what Jesus came to share with us, overcoming victory. Victory over circumstances. Now, I just said that Jesus said the word. Jesus won the victory. Jesus possesses the victory. <clears throat> and he's willing to share. Aren't you glad that God is willing to share with us? He shared so much with us as we celebrated, as we remembered his body through the bread this morning, and the cup reminding us of his blood. As we looked around, it was quite a sight when the people spread out 
from all four walls all the way around and made this one continuous circle. And it just spoke to my heart that there's something very special about this circle which cannot be broken because of the overcoming victory that God shares with us. He's not done sharing with us after the cross. He was not done sharing with us after the tomb. He's not done sharing with us because a great Sunday morning is over. He's ready to share with us tonight. It's the Lord's Day, and so is Monday, because every day is His day. And on Monday, He will share with us if we will allow it. He was the first fruits of our resurrection. He who we celebrate next Sunday, His resurrection, we need to be reminded that His resurrection He shares with us. Not just shares that He did it, but allows us to follow in those footsteps and in His name and by His power conquer death for us and share with us salvation. Share with us the ability for us to be resurrected as well. The grave has no victory. Death has no sting. No power over us. He is the first fruits of our resurrection and He even shares that with us. But that's in the future that we receive our share of His resurrection. We have not yet physically received that. Now we've just, we're just as sure to receive it as if we already had. <clears throat> we're as saved uh, now as we ever will be. We're already in the heavenlies, Ephesians tells us, in God's mind who is timeless. But he's not shared the physical resurrection with us yet. But I'll tell you what he will share with us today, and we don't have to wait for, and that's victory, victory in Jesus. I'm thankful that God shares. One day, he will share with us all the riches of heaven. But not before he shared himself with us here in this world. Not only will he share with us great riches in the sweet by and by, but he shares with us what we need most right now, which is not riches which would totally distract us and ruin us. What we need right now is victory in the nasty here and now. The sweet by and by is someday. And I'm going to get carried away when I get carried away. But for now, we need victory. And he shares with us overcoming victory. If you still have your handout from this morning, talking about trials in verse 33, he says, ye shall have tribulation. Here's the facts. Number one, the facts. Notice he did not say if. But when? Ye shall have tribulation. It's the only sure thing. The only sure thing that this world has to offer us is trouble. We will have pain, both physical and emotional. Fear and frustration and disappointment and discouragement and disease and even death apply to all of us, Christian or not. Job 5 he said, man is born into trouble as sparks fly upward. It's, it's as natural as sparks going up. Job 14, if you're born of woman, you're a few days and full of trouble. It's just nature. Isaiah 8.22, lesser known, says, behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish. Anybody depressed yet? Acts 14.22, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That's what he promised in verse 33 as well. And so when you hear that TV preacher or that certain radio preacher say that God wants to bless you with a trouble-free life, you can know two things about him. He has a non-functioning head and a closed Bible because you just can't get that from the word of God. It is popular teaching. It does tickle ears. 
and boy does it put rears in seats and coins in offering plates. But it's not true. And if getting saved is the end of your troubles, it's the front end because now you've got a new enemy, an all new set of troubles. Becoming a born again Christian doesn't exempt us, does it? Doesn't exempt you from trouble. But it does mean that you've got a new father, a new friend to walk the road of trials with you and to help us be, ha be, be able to receive overcoming victory in his name, claiming his victory so we don't have to live under the circumstances. We can live over as overcomers. Do I have an amen tonight? Overcomers are not under the circumstances. That's the facts. Number two, the forms. Notice number two, the forms. Over in James 1, 2, he says, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That word temptations means trials, but what is that word D-I-V-E-R-S? What does that mean? We get our word diverse from it. But the Greek word right there translated means multicolored. Multicolored. That speaks to my heart. Because our trials come in all colors, shapes, and sizes, and degrees. Sometimes you just say, I couldn't have made that up. What just happened? My trials are not like yours. Yours are not like mine. But James was writing to a group of Jews who were being scattered because of trials of persecution. Jesus in our text was writing to a group of Jews, his followers, who were about to be scattered by fear. Your trial may be financial. It may be physical, health-related. It might be relationship-based or emotional. Your trial could be like some of mine, made by your own choices. My own bad choices lead to some of my trials. Uh, if, we make, if we conduct our finances in ways that are contrary to what God teaches in His Word, we will suffer for it. It's just natural if we put things into our bodies, whether it's through the, the mouth or the vein or the nose or whatever, that do not belong there, it will speed our demise. If we choose to conduct our marriage differently than God has commanded, we shouldn't wonder why it falls apart. If our mind focuses on just about anything and everything other than the things of God, we shouldn't be surprised when our emotions then go haywire on us. Well, you know what we've all done? We've all started our own business. Yep, we're in business. Uh, manufacturing. What? Manufacturing what? Our own misery. We do lead ourselves to many of our own trials, but not all of them. Certainly not. Three categories of trials. Jot it down, please. There's a trial from God. A trial from God is really a test. A test. Because though he loves us just as we are, he loves us too much to leave us that way. He wants to test us and grow us into something bigger. And he will put us through tests. He wants something better for us. He cares about our happiness, but he cares much more about our holiness. Which, of course, holiness will lead us to real contentment anyway. And so he allows trials to mold us and shape us. Raise your hand if you've ever been put on the fire and you know it was God put me on this fire to purify me. Raise your hand. He does that, doesn't he? But there comes forth a vessel for the finer when the dross rises to the top under the fire and you can scrape it off. He can scrape it off. Job, who wrote those depressing verses we looked at about trouble and the earth, uh, Job is the one who said, I shall come forth as gold. And the Bible talks about gold purified in the fire. 
Now, if you just raised your hand to that, you told the truth. If you didn't, you know it was true anyway. You also know that sometimes he puts you on the rack to stretch you into something bigger than you are. So you can do things, and he can accomplish things through you that you never thought you could before. He'll stretch you. It's uncomfortable. I don't even want to be capable of more. But he says, but you're going to do more. And in order to do more, I'm going to need to stretch you. And you're going to need to live by faith. Because finish it for me, a faith that can't be tested can't be what? Trusted. If your faith can't be tested by God, then it can't be trusted. We need a faith that can be tested then. So it can be trusted. I'll give you an example. A guy named Abe. Well, Abraham, the Bible calls him, was told by God, after waiting so long for the child of promise, him saying, you're going to become a great nation. And here's the child of promise. It's going to all start with this one. And God gave Abraham a test. He said, now take him up on the hill And kill him. Sacrifice him. Who? The promised son? Yep. Sacrifice the promised son. The the one that was the answer to our prayers that you gave to us as a gift? Yes, give him back to me. He's going to birth a great nation? How is he going to do that if he's dead? That's probably what we would say. But Abraham passed the test, and his faith grew because of that. Then what was the end result? Did God learn something new about Abraham that day? No. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? God didn't need to test Abraham to see what Abraham was made of. He knew what Abraham was made of. Just like he knew what Job was made of when he allowed Satan to tempt him. He knew that he was going to come forth better on the other side, come forth as gold. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurred to God? God did not learn anything new about Abraham that day. This happened as a test for Abraham's sake. For Abraham to learn something new about God on that day. That's who learned something new on that day was Abraham. God's not testing us now. Let's watch and see what they do. He's testing us to grow us, to strengthen us, to stretch us so we can become overcomers, so trials can make us better and bigger, and hopefully not bitter. And so comes the old saying, never waste a good trial. Why waste a good trial? Now, how can we waste a trial? God sends us a trial. How can we waste it? I'm scratching my head because nobody's answering my question. Do you know? Don't trust Him through the trial. That's a good answer. I'm sorry. If you don't learn anything from it, yeah. Yeah. If I'm going to go through this pain, shouldn't I receive the gain? Did somebody else say something? Okay, if you if you do get bitter over it instead of get better or or bigger, get bitter instead. Get mad at God. Now I understand when a lost person says, if "God really loved me," that wouldn't happen. They're misunderstanding, but I think it's. A little different for a lost person to get bitter at God and blame things on God. What's really appalling is when we as believers actually get mad at the God who's proven his love to us. us. But we're kind of proven that we're just like the Israelites in the wilderness. You know, he could do big, huge things. He could part the waters. And it doesn't take a day before we're going, but I'm thirsty. And I don't think you're going to be able to help me. Because to help me, it would take 
you have in power over water. And he just divided the waters. It's a shame on me when I so quickly forget who I'm dealing with. An overcoming God who wants to grant to me victory after victory in his name. Don't waste a good trial. Pass the test. Don't raise your hand to this one. It'd be embarrassing. But you know people who've fallen out of church because of trials, don't you? You don't know what I'm going through, they say. I guess God doesn't want to help me. If ever we need to be in God's house, it's when we're going through a trial. You know the very most important time to pray? When you don't feel like praying. <laughs> when do we do most of our praying? Oh, when I feel like it. When we don't feel like it. When we're going through a trial. Why go to church? It doesn't do any good. Just look at all the trouble in my life. That, that's said by a person. They're, they're saying, I've tried going God's way, and it didn't take. <laughs> I tried going to church. didn't work. It didn't make my life wonderful. <laughs> Back the truck up. Beep, beep, beep. What are they implying when they say that? I tried it. It didn't work. They're implying that the only reason they went to church was for selfish purposes to see what God will do for them. Not what can I do for my Lord and Savior. It's the only reason we go to church so things will go well. Why tithe? It didn't do any good. Why pray? It doesn't work. Why should we do these things? In a word, because our God is worthy. He is worthy of that. And not for personal gain. Anybody can praise God on the mountaintop. I do it all the time when I'm on a mountaintop. But when He knows that we really are praising Him, is when we praise Him in the valley. When we say, thank you, Lord, for going through this valley with me. I'm not going to waste this trial. Boil me. Stretch me. Grow me. Chastise me. Correct me. And grow me through this. Do not let the wind of trouble blow you away from God. Allow the winds of trouble to blow you right into the arms of God. That's where we belong. That's where true peace is found. And that word peace is in our text. Go back to 16.33, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. You know, there's something about the word peace. There's even something about the way it sounds. Peace. And it's that way in every language, I'm told. Because when man's looking for words to convey thoughts, they often try to look for words that sound like what they're trying to convey. And in English, Peace. It's a sweet word. And it's the opposite of tribulation. It's the opposite of trials. It's the opposite of tribulation. And he gives us peace even in the storm. Because we're no longer really in the storm if we're over it. If we're rising up on eagle's wings. If we're overcomers. We might still feel like we're going through the storm. And in truth, the eagle who is above the storm is still touching the storm. It's the storm that's holding him up. 
I'm still in the storm. I'm just in a zone on the edge. Call it surfing, if you will. That first category of trial is a trial from God. Now a trial from Satan. The Bible says there are trials from Satan. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 says, We would have come unto you, but Satan hindered us. Satan gave him that trial. How were they hindered? In that passage, the Bible doesn't tell us, but maybe it was illness. Maybe it was a roadblock. Maybe it was the authorities. Maybe it was one of the times that the crowd stoned Paul. Maybe his chariot ran out of gas. I don't know. But Satan hindered. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul said, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Who gave it to him? The messenger of Satan. Who's the messenger of Satan? What is the messenger of Satan? Well, let's back up. Who's the messenger of God? His messengers are known as angels, right? And so I would think that the messenger of Satan is what kind of angel? A fallen angel, a.k.a. a demon, right? We don't know his name. We don't need to know his name. I don't want to know his name. But Paul knew that Satan sent one of his demons to give me this thorn in the flesh. And right in the very verse, it ends with him using a statement that he probably didn't even recognize what it meant as God told him to write it down. Lest I should be exalted above measure. The demon didn't care if he was exalted above measure, right? God did. The God who works all things together for good allowed even that messenger. We think of the angel Gabriel as God's favorite messenger, right? Go send this message. This one came from Satan and one of his messengers, and yet God was still the one working through it, lest he should be exalted above measure. That's amazing. Now here's the difference. There's God's tests and trials. There's Satan's trials. God tests us to bring out the best, Satan to bring out the worst. God wants to help us to stand, Satan wants to cause us to stumble. God meant it for our maturity, Satan means it for our misery. And yet God can work through it all no matter if it's from him or whether it's from Satan. Because he helps us to overcome and be an overcomer in his name but there's a third category of trial I said once from God once from Satan what would you say the third one might be the what <laughs> we talked about that many of our trials are of, of our own making it's true but uh, of those trials of our own making God can use those. Satan can use those too and capitalize on them. There's a bigger umbrella area of trial and it happens to every single one of us and it really doesn't have anything to do with God or Satan. And it's this third category, a trial of the curse. The curse that's upon this planet, this world. Because of sin... So yes, Satan does play a, a role. But this world is cursed and bad things happen. And it may not necessarily be your own personal sin, your own choice. Here on earth, things go bad. They break. Murphy's Law applies to every one of us. Wednesday night, we were talking about wars. And all the wars that are constantly raging on the planet, there's always been war. And then we talked about the millennium. Can you imagine? Can you imagine even a, a week-long time of peace on earth where there was no war at all for a week? 
that would be amazing. Imagine if it lingered on for months and a year, a year of peace on the earth. Unimaginable. Imagine a thousand years like that. The millennium. We who are saved will return from heaven with him to earth, the earth that was under the curse. And for that long period of time, the curse is lifted and we will see this world for the first time with our eyes. We will see this world the way that God meant for it to be. I mean, the way it started off in Eden and the way that it will be in the very end in the new Jerusalem, in heaven, in the eternal state. The millennium will be like that in that it will be a time of peace and a time without trial. He will set things right and the curse will be lifted off of the planet. The curse of nature will be gone. Have you ever seen a train wreck? Or seen the carnage that results afterward? You've probably seen it on TV. Maybe even in our own state over in uh, Palestine, East Palestine. The carnage. They say if you ever do see that happening in progress, a train derailment, that it really is something that you can't look away from and it's something you can't do anything about. And it is like slow motion. Ever seen these videos or been a part of one of these blizzards where nobody sees the road ahead of them and car after car is piling up? 100 car pileups? You can't do anything about it. When you look at this world, when we look at this world, we aren't seeing it the way that God intended it to be. We're seeing what happened after man wrecked it with his sin and the curse was applied. So sometimes trials can't be blamed on God or Satan. It's just a tribute to the curse on this present world. That's why a plot of weeds will never turn into a beautiful flower garden on its own. It takes work. But a flower garden left alone will, without any effort at all, eventually turn into a plot of weeds. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's the opposite of this evolution thing that they're teaching in our schools. Things are winding down, losing energy and order. It's devolution. For instance, before Adam sinned, his body never aged. After sin, it did, and eventually he died. When I ride my bike a few miles and wake up sore the next day, I don't ask God what test he's giving me. I don't blame the devil for being sore either. I know it's just a fact of life in a sin-cursed earth, in a sin-cursed body. But we have this promise from God that he has overcome. He's overcome the world, the world that has the curse upon it. He's overcome that. He's gained the victory, and he will share it with us. Even if your trial is of your own making, you can give your mistakes to God and allow him to share with you the power to overcome. And he will use those negatives to help develop a pretty big picture. Imagine with me breakfast tomorrow morning and your spouse says, close your eyes and open your mouth. First of all, would you do that? Miss Brenda, would you do that if Terry said, because he's the cook in your house, right? If he said, close your eyes and open your mouth, would you do it? You see how much trust has developed over the years? I know you too well. Here's our illustration. He says, honey, close your eyes, open your mouth, and so you do it. Let's say Brenda does it. And then he serves you a big spoonful of flour. Gold medal flour. <laughs> You'd do a spit take, dust would fly through the air, 
there'd be a white haze all around you. And you'd spit it out, wouldn't you? What if, instead of the flour, what he had put in your mouth was Crisco? Um, Crisco doesn't taste good by the spoonful, no. Oh, let's say it wasn't flour, it wasn't Crisco, it was baking soda. Even worse, now he's really getting punished. Oh, here's something else. What if somebody, without your knowledge, put a big gulp of buttermilk in your mouth? If you're saved, you'll spit that stuff out. Some of you drink that nasty stuff. How many of you like buttermilk? I don't, okay, maybe you're saved. But you're not right with God. You can repent and you can make these things right. I just listed a bunch of nasty ingredients by themselves, but mix it all together. Wonderful biscuits. Yeah? That's what our overcoming God offers to us. This world offers us a bunch of bad ingredients. Some of them are of our own making, some of them are from Satan. But God works it all together for good. Romans 8, 28. You know the verse. God has overcome the world. He has overcome the devil. He's overcome the curse of sin. And His recipe of overcoming power, He wants to share with us that was James 1, 2, right, that we showed you? Count it all joy when ye fall. Fall, let's focus on that word. Fall into, it says. Uh, it comes from one Greek word. The two words fall into comes from one Greek word, parapento. Parapento, which means a sudden fall that's unexpected. Have you ever been walking through your yard and accidentally stepped in a gopher hole? You know how that does to you when you thought it was going to be at this level and then it's down there or whatever? That's parapento, a sudden fall that's unexpected. You're expecting to put your foot down on solid ground and it turns out to be that hole. It's the same word that's used in the parable of the Good Samaritan when it says that uh, the Good Samaritan helped the man who fell among thieves. He, he unexpectedly parapentoed. Things were going great, and then a sudden change of luck. And that describes most Mondays, right? <laughs> and other days that end in Y. Many times the trials of life come upon us suddenly like a storm, and out of nowhere you get one phone call and everything changes. The lady we've been praying for this weekend just wasn't feeling good. And went to the doctor to find out things have not been good for some time, perhaps. A car runs a red light and changes your life forever. And everybody's had some of these experiences. And you've probably had one that's the one. I'll never forget the moment I heard that. Or that that happened. But we move on in life, and we have some good days, and most of our world today, most of America today is saying, I'm doing fine, blood pressure's down, stocks are up, eat, drink, and be merry. But you know the best time to prepare for trials is not in the midst of the storm, it's before they happen, as they surely will. Let's be done, number three, the fruit, the fruit. If God could stop all our trials, and He could, then why doesn't He? He could stop all of our trials. So let's answer this question tonight. Why doesn't He? Write it down for our enjoyment. The verse that we put up said, count it all joy. That's a tall order. It requires faith. You see, we say... What can't be cured must be endured. God says, uh, what can't be cured should be enjoyed, because I'm going to work it for good. 
He's not telling us to have the attitude, just fake it till you make it. He wants us to have the attitude of, I'm a world overcomer in his name. That's supernatural in nature. The fruit, he wants enjoyment to result from our trials. And endurance, endurance. James 1.3, the very next verse says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Patience meaning to bear up under or to endure. Have you ever said, Lord, I wish I was a stronger Christian? Oh, Lord, I wish I had more faith. I wish I was more steadfast, more dedicated. If you really mean it, God's going to send you to the gym for a workout. There's going to be pain, but there's going to be gain because muscles are built under stress and pressure. Tissue actually tears and more is grown in its place. God's gym. God will use trials to exercise our character. Because we really don't usually pray for healing until we need healing. We don't strive for victory until we find ourselves in a battle. It's only once we realize that we're in a race that we seek to have some endurance. You know when we start trying to take care of our health? Not when we have it, but when we start to lose it. It's only natural for our enlargement. Is the next to last one for our enlargement? The next verse in James, James 1, 4. Let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire. That word perfect meaning mature, grown. 1 Peter 5, 10. After you've suffered a while, it'll make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. Hey, somebody tell me what happens if you... If you walk up to a caterpillar in its cocoon, metamorphosis has taken place and it's in its cocoon now, and you see it trying to get out and struggling to emerge, and you use your hands and help it out, what happens? It dies. It needs the struggle in order to survive, in order to make it strong enough to fly. That's why if we do everything for our kids, we're actually not doing them a favor. But I tend to depend upon my God more when I'm struggling with something. There he's maturing, he's strengthening. Last one, it's for our enrichment. Our enrichment. Uh, you see the word entire? Uh, go back. Are we on that one? Yeah, perfect and entire. That word entire from the Greek word holokleros. You ever get tired of hearing Greek words? Holokleros, what does it make you think of? It's where we get our word holograph. Okay? He wants to make us perfect and entire. It's a 3D, it's a holograph. It's a 3D, 360, 360 degree depiction of an object. That's a holograph. You know what that is? It's the entire package. It's a word picture here. I believe God is saying he wants to make us well-rounded Christians. Don't settle for less than the whole package. Allow him to share with you overcoming victory. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, it's through your dear Son that you purchased for us the victory. Thank you that it was shared with us. Now help us to walk as overcomers. As we go through this Passion Week, Lord, may our hearts be constantly on what you did for us at every stage of the week. It's not just during our Easter service next Lord's Day, Lord, that we want to worship you and remember what you did. On this Palm Sunday, we remember what you did on that day. We remember that all these teachings that we've been studying the last few months happened in the following few days on the weekdays. 
and before the garden and before you were crucified. So much packed into a week. I pray that you give us a powerful overcoming week as we meditate on these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.